super live. Great, guys. Comment if you can hear us. Yeah. Cool, cool. Let me refresh this. Oh, 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 oh. Hearing our own ads. This is exciting. What's going on, guys? Excited to be here. Let's uh, jump right into this. Now, the dumb question is where is the comment on here? see comments? I can't see shit. I can't. Not you can yet. see them? No. You will be able to see them. Fantastic. You'll have to let me know who we got in here so I can see. Don't click schedule. That's weird. That's weird. What's going on, guys? Just kind of getting the little bugs worked out here. Um, we figured we would jump on a live, answer any sort of questions you have um, about Elite FTS, about Dave, about working here, about the podcast, about training, anything you got. Um, Alex is going to be helping us out, kind of corralling the questions and uh, going from there. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, podcast. We have uh, the latest episode is an episode with me and Dave. It's a really, really good episode. Check that out on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts. We had a lot of fun doing it. Um, another video that came out today on paused and tempo deadlifts. Check out our YouTube for that. And I think that's pretty much it for now. So Alex, do we have anything coming in? Let me look. And we can see. As always, Monster Hydro on deck. If you guys haven't tried these, these are delicious. Uh, these super sport ones. Pretty good. Pretty good way to sh kind of mix things up. All right. We got some questions coming in uh, from David. Thoughts on velocity-based training. Which linear, linear positional transducers to use? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, velocity-based training is a tool that I have not personally used a terribly huge amount. I see it as potentially massively beneficial, especially if you're going to be using, uh, using the equipment with athletes and specifically people f focused in on the velocity at which they're moving, right? So uh, I know Tendo units are super expensive. I think Just Fly Sports has a variation of that. I know one of my buddies was telling me about a velocity, uh, like a velocity-based training tool that he uses that's fairly inexpensive that attaches to an app on your phone. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a ton of personal experience utilizing it. I understand the importance of it and how it can be beneficial, but the Tendo units, I think, is the gold standard for measuring uh, velocity-based training, but they are, again, they are super, super expensive. So that's what I got for that. David also wants to know um, which books on the site are best to buy or to learn more about velocity-based training. Ooh, good question. Um, now that we have a search function on the site, we should put, we can probably put a few into the chat box for them. We can probably just look something up real quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the search function. The search function is going to play ball with me. I tend to have bad luck with these. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, David, what we'll do is if, uh, we, we can find a few good ones for you, we'll put them in the chat for you. That'll be good. All right. Some uh, Mouse Blues on Instagram says elbow pain on the bench press and triceps. And uh, that's all I got. That's it? Okay, that's, cool. That's awesome. Is that Instagram? That's Instagram. That's Instagram. All right. Um, anytime you're dealing with any sort of pain at all, first off, go to a clinician, go to a doctor, get it checked out. Um, what I would say with you, if you're getting it in the same time, the same position every time, I would focus in on essentially your setup, understanding like maybe what your other exercises you're doing. Um, I don't know any sort of history you may have with elbows, elbows pain or pain in general. I don't know if you have an injury. I don't know how if you have um, any sort of you know historical data that would suggest that that elbow is going to be an issue going forward, or if it's could be something 
from a lack of shoulder stability, lack of uh, thoracic rotation. Who knows? I have no idea. I'm not a PT. I'm not a doctor. Um, but if it's hurting you all the time, I would get it checked out. If it only hurts sometimes, I would start to kind of dig deeper and to see what you were doing in that situation that may have caused any sort of elbow pain or, or elbow discomfort. That would be my my suggestion for you. What was it? Mighty Mouse or something? Mighty something like that. Mighty, <laughs> mighty, <laughs> mighty Elbows. Um, Benjamin Melendez on the YouTube channel says that, hey, Sam, uh, Dave talked about sodium loading, but I can't find anything related to power lifting. Everything is about bodybuilding. Do you have any pointers related to sodium lifting and strength sports? Sodium loading in general, um, I, I have more of a background with uh, like the athletic population in general. Um, it, sodium is super important. Electrolytes are super important. Um, and it's usually, Dave talks about it in the bodybuilding world because it's usually when you're on a bodybuilding diet, it's very, very low in sodium. So you run into a lot of issues with your, your training, with your fullness, with your recovery, with your hydration. Um, Stan Efferding actually does a really good job going in depth, and we were just talking about this today, um, on the importance of sodium for performance, right? Making sure that you are getting enough sodium, but also the potassium, magnesium, all electrolytes into your system uh, to counteract the amount that you sweat, right? So. To kind of keep it as simple as possible, you are able to produce more force uh, throughout your musculature in your body if you have the appropriate level of, ele of electrolytes. You won't cramp as much, you'll, you'll perform better, you'll feel better, which is really, really important. Um, just like with a lot of nutrition stuff uh, and, and overall health and, and wellness things such as sodium levels and nutrition in general, I would always err on the side of doing the things that help you feel better because if you feel better, you can perform better, right? So without necessarily going, needing to go into too much detail about the actual systems at play, if you are going to perform your best, you need to make sure you are hydrated, you need to make sure you have, your electrolytes are in balance, and you need to make sure that if you're on the platform, you're not cramping, right? So very simple. Make sure you're getting enough sodium, make sure you're getting enough electrolytes in general, and make sure that you're hydrating plenty, especially now that it's hot out, right? So. It's amazing how much of your hydration level can drop to the shitter if you're not taking, you know, enough of that intake in. All right, Sam, we've got a really good excuse for you to talk about yourself here. Uh, Harry underscore Watson underscore lean lifter mm -hmm. uh, says, your bio, please. Why do you guys keep avoiding this question? Oh, okay. <laughs> My bio. I've been in the private sector uh, for about since about 2016-ish. Um, my initial career path, I was, I got my master's degree in counseling. So I have a very different career path than most strength and conditioning professionals. Um, I made my shift into the private sector training athletes, training uh, personal training clients. I worked in several different facilities in the Rhode Island area for uh, like baseball. I worked with football players. I worked with, um, some strongman competitors as well. Um, I grew that business, my personal training business, as well as the amount of athletes that I have. And I took that into um, actually a director of uh, health and wellness and a director of fitness at a, uh, it would be a corporate wellness facility. So I was the head of training there. I was the head of um, all the programs there dealing with the faculty and staff of that facility. I have a background with, I'm one of the few McGill Method certified practitioners in the United States. It's me and Brian Carroll actually are one of the few, um, I think there's about eight to 10 of us. So I have a background in psychology and counseling. I have a background in training as well. I have a background in low back health and all sorts of fun stuff. So, good question. All right. Uh, oh, and I've been writing for Elite FTS. I think I have a half a dozen articles here. That was one of the main ways that I got connected with the company. You can check on the site, search EliteFTS.com slash Sam Brown. You'll, you'll find all the stuff I wrote on there as well. So, good right. question. Nice little plug there. Uh, <laughs> looks like we're getting some people buying some badges on the Instagram, which is kind Ooh, of like a super chat. That's cool. What's that look like? 
Uh, what does that look like? It says so and so bought a badge. So cool. Maybe. Thank you for buying badges. I don't know what what that means. Um, that's a new thing. Yeah, that's neat. A uh, little bit of a philosophical question here. Oh boy. Um, what do you consider strong as far as relative strength, like three x your body weight in squat and so forth? Um, I. Mean, it, I take a different kind of a stance on that. I don't have like the hard and fast standards, right? Like if you can squat three times your body weight, of course you're strong, right? But with the populations that I've uh, spent a lot of time with, um, with post-injury, uh, post-rehab clients, low back clients, I see a lot of strength coming from their resiliency to handle hardship. I see strength as not just the pounds on the bar. I see strength as your ability to handle hard things, to handle situations that are out of your control and to be able to do the work necessary to propel yourself out of a shitty situation to you know, get to the place where you wanna be or, or get to a goal or, or an objective that you have. Um, yeah, it, it, I don't, again, it's, it is, since it's a philosophical question, I'll take that as my philosophical answer. I think that strength is your ability to handle hard shit, right? Do hard things, um, handle difficult times, handle pressure, handle setbacks, and to be resilient through that. All right. Uh, we have a few people saying you're a little bit on the quiet end. Oh, am I? I'll yeah. sneak right up. You can sneak up on that. So Boom. Is that better? Is that better? Test, test, one, two. Test, test. Please let us know. Because I can, we can keep yelling. That's fine. We love yelling. We <laughs> it's the best. Um, all right. What do we got? What do we got? Thank you, by the way, for badges and, and super chats and whatnot. Um, I know Dave mentions this a lot, um, and, and it, it, it's really true. It's one of the best ways that you can support Elite FTS is to do super chats, is to do questions and super stickers, and I mean, we're, especially with like the podcast, right? There's a ton of work that goes into the podcast in terms of prep, in terms of get, getting the guests out, in terms of the production of it. It's a ton and ton and ton of work, uh, but we love doing it. We love doing it. We love you know being able to offer it to everybody on YouTube and on Instagram and wherever you guys are. And it's something that we're going to keep doing, but anytime you guys can support us in any way, buy a band set, buy a book, do whatever, um, we're actually working with, and this may be a good time to mention the, uh, the affiliates that yes. we may be working with going forward, right? So this is kind of super secret information that was going to be on the podcast, but since you guys are here, I'll give it to you guys first. Um, we are going to start working with Onnit, which is super cool. Um, we're going to start kind of promoting some of their products because we use their products, we believe in their products, and we know a lot of you do as well. So what, we're going to go into this more in depth. So this, we're still in kind of the, the, baby, step, the baby steps of, this, of this, uh, uh, this partnership, but it's really, really cool because it's going to be one of the first partnerships that we have for the podcast. And it's going to be something that we can help support you with your nutritional goals, with your supplementation goals. And now that if you're going to be working with Onnit or utilize Onnit products in general, now this is a great way for you to still purchase that high quality product and to be able to support the podcast and what we do here as well. So very cool stuff. Um, yeah, just it's kind of a cool thing to kind of be able to build that and bridge that gap. So we actually we do have a link in the description. Uh, for a trial of Alpha Brain. So Absolutely. Interested. Yep. So if you guys util have ever utilized Alpha Brain or are interested in trying Alpha Brain, it's one of the main products that we're using in house. Um, there, click that link down below. Sign up for a free trial. It's a totally free trial. Um, it's it's really really cool, and I'm excited to be able to help kind of facilitate that partnership too. So check that out, and, and you'll hear us talk more about it on the podcast in the future, but I wanted to give you guys specifically a sneak peek on what's going on on the back end of things, because it's something that we talk about all the time and it's nice to stay transparent with, with all the listeners and whatnot, so. 
Stefan asks, Sam, did you do the prescript certification? I did. How did you know? Or is that shirt some love for the boys? Oh, I, do. I do love the boys of prescript. Uh, but yes, I've actually uh, completed all of their courses, their barbell course, their weightlifting course, level one, level, I'm doing level two right now. Um, and and I'm, I mean, we're going to have to talk about how we're going to be chatting with, yes. with Dr. Jordan Shallow himself. Again, this is a inside scoop. I'm going to be doing uh, a nice chat next week with Jordan Shallow. More details to come on that. Just talking about what he's been doing, uh, all the stuff he has going on. But yeah, no, I, I've done the prescript courses. They're fantastic. Jordan, uh, Jordan, Jordan, Killian, and now they're, uh, they got James Mack and Thayer over there as well. They are all awesome people, and they get my seal of approval, and I do enjoy their shirts. <laughs> all right. Cade Maney on Instagram asks, what is your favorite session you've done? Ooh. You know what? It's like a love-hate relationship, right? I love the yoke bar, right? It's 100% it's my favorite, but I also hate the yoke bar because it's, it can be very, very difficult. <laughs> uh, I've always said this, for strongman competitors, having an SS yoke bar is probably one of the best tools you can have specifically for strongman training. Um, it's been something that I've used plenty in the past. And if you were looking to get the most bang for your buck and kind of keep those shoulders a little bit healthy, maybe off-season power lift or whatever, it's a fantastic bar. Um, We've done videos on it. We've done videos. You can do front squats with it. We can do Zercher squats with it. You can do a million different presses with it, JM presses, right? Um, very versatile bar that you can use for a lot of different things. And if I had one when I was, I had my garage gym. It was one of my first purchases. Actually, my first purchase was uh, a back extension. I bought a back extension from Goodwin. And uh, then they came out with the, what was it, the G4 the, the combo back extension where they changed the pad on me. That was cool. That was a cool trick. Thanks, good one. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's, uh, that was one of my first purchases for my garage gym was a yoke bar. So I would say that's my favorite specialty bar. And if you haven't gotten one, they're finally back in stock, and you guys should check them out. All right. Great plug there. Uh, you can find those at EliteFTS.com. EliteFTS <laughs> um, all right. Noda Random. Is it necessary to deload before switching programs? I am an intermediate going from a peaking block to some linear conjugate. Yeah, I mean, if you're on a peaking block and you peak and you test your numbers, it's probably for the best to deload for a while and to kind of give your, give your body some time to kind of heal up after the beatdown. You've been giving it for a few weeks, right? So that's something that Dave has always said with anybody that trains on the weekends is, the injuries don't usually happen on the peak. It usually happens a week or two after the peak when you're, you know, uh, still trying to recover neurologically and whatnot. So, yeah, absolutely. Anytime you're going from a peak, if, you're, if it's an actual, like, a real peak where you're testing yourself, I would take about a week or so, depending on what your training looks like, depending on the weights you're using. But, yeah, give yourself some time to kind of relax a little bit, decompress, um, just – like Dave would always say, take the bar off your back and out of your hands. Spend some time working on the stuff you're really bad at. And then you can jump into a new program if you have another goal. So that would be my uh, advice for that. All right. Um, Sergi G. Litz on Instagram asks, how lean do you think a power lifter can get? I'm planning to cut for most of this winter, and I'm wondering how shredded I can get without sacrificing strength. Well, I mean, anytime you're in a caloric deficit, you're not going to be putting performance first. Um, and I have more of a personal example of the strongman world, right? So if you're, anytime you're cutting for a, a meet or a contest, you are sacrificing performance to get down to a lower weight class, right? Anytime that you're going through a, a crazy water cut, you are dehydrating yourself, you're putting yourself in such a crazy caloric deficit, and you're not going to be your best, right? If you're an, do you say an intermediate? Yeah. Yeah, so 
I, I would first ask, like, why are you cutting in the first place, right? If, if you don't have to cut, don't cut, especially if you're not going for any sort of crazy record, right? No world record or money's at stake. Just kind of compete where your body weight is, and you'll probably find that you'll do better if you walk into a, con if, into a meet or a contest or whatever you're doing, not having to worry about the weight on the scale and not having to worry about modifying your diet as much as you can, right? Is because now what you're thinking about is if you're worried about being super lean and performing well at a powerlifting meet, those are different goals. That's two different ends of that spectrum, right? So it sounds to me like you want to be lean more than you want to do well at the meet. So if that's the case, then go in as lean as you want, right? Go in whatever weight class you want to do. Um, but if your goal is to move the most weight, I don't think many people will find success cutting weight and doing better for the most part. So especially at the intermediate level, it's, it's, it's almost like an unwarranted or unneeded stress for you to put yourself under. So I, if you want to get lean, get lean. But if you want to do well at the meet, I would just focus on doing well at the meet. All right. And tangent to that, Park McLean asks, how did you lose 30 pounds? I lost 30 pounds. I worked with a uh, nutritionist. Actually, I worked with uh, Trevor Cashy specifically, his team. Shout out Dr. Trevor Cashy. Awesome guy. And kept it super simple. I... To be honest, I didn't do any cardio. I just kept steps at a certain amount. I watched what my intake was. The biggest thing that I took away from that experience of losing weight was understanding where you are starting from, right? Understanding where your base calories are and understand what you're putting into your body to start. It's all about information. It's all about data. And it's all about having the information necessary for you to make a better decision. So if you don't track what you eat, if you don't understand what your body is utilizing for caloric expenditure to start, you're not going to know how much to cut. You're not going to know how much you can lose. You're not going to know like what you can do to get the most bang for your buck. When you're losing weight, if your goal is to just change your body composition, I would throw the timetable out the window. I wouldn't pressurize the situation anymore by saying you need to lose X amount of weight in X amount of time. The biggest thing for me when I was losing the weight was understanding that's more about behavior change than it is about anything else, right? Understanding the behaviors that I'm doing that are pushing me away from my goal of being leaner and the behaviors that are pushing me towards that goal of losing the weight. Keeping it as simple as you can. Understanding, like I said, how much you're eating now, what your body weight is once a week, twice a week, whatever. Understanding the habits that will help you better lose weight, right? How many steps you're doing, what your activity level is, and be realistic with your activity level. If you say that you are, you know, going to train four or five days a week, you're going to change your diet, it's like, be realistic with yourself. It's like, if you're not, if you're training twice a week now, why would you want to train six days a week? You know, most people wouldn't be able to sustain that. And again, it's all about that sustainable behavior change over time. So what I did, again, just understood how much I was eating, started to reduce that just a little bit, and we're talking like, teeny tiny bits, right? Increasing the total activity that I had during the day, kept my training at a certain level. I kept the weights kind of high. I didn't go right into any sort of hypertrophy work or anything like that. I kept the weights high, kept the compound lifts in, and just was consistent with it. And I didn't force myself to lose X amount of weight in, a certain, in an X amount of time. So that's, that's all the information that I can kind of give you uh, on the topic and what worked for me. But it was that slow and steady kind of consistent approach and consistent effort that really made the biggest difference. All right. Alex McGoran's double O asks, in conjugate max out days, do you replace by doubles and singles or low RPE singles with more volume? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's your training. You can really do whatever the hell you want, you know? But like should you? Should I? In terms of if your goal is max effort, I'm a firm believer that max effort can be sets of three, sets of two, sets of five maybe, if that's your max effort. It all depends on your skill. It all depends on your training age. It all depends on your goals, right? So I think if you're, 
and one of the questions that I have for you is like, are you finding success doing the thing you're doing? If that's a yes, then I'd say, yeah, then keep going, right? If you're not hitting the goals that you want to hit or you're not reaching the levels of strength that you want to get to, it's like, okay, well, what things can we adjust? Um, but I would say if it's working for you, keep going. If it's not working for you, then that's, uh, you may want to adjust more to a traditional conjugate system and give that a try. That may not work either for you. Who knows, right? When it comes to training, especially your own, your own training, you really just got to figure out what's going to work for you. What do we got back there, Chuckles? Uh, Austin asks, I want to start a YouTube fitness channel. How would you recommend that I do that? Uh, get hired by a company that already has one. That's pretty much it. I don't, it's, that's, yeah. I, I would just find a topic or find things that you want to talk about and just turn a camera on and talk about them and see how that goes, right? I mean, you, you can probably find YouTube videos on how to make YouTube videos, right? You can probably Google, like, Google, Google things, right? I, I would... If you're passionate about something and you and you find an interest in it and, and you feel as if you can help people with a topic or help people with a thing, turn a camera on, film yourself talking about it and doing that thing. See what happens. All right. Um, GS Murph with four Fs nice. on Instagram asks, tips for stubborn arms, skinny arms for full body sports. Yes, eating enough calories. So you've got that. Okay. Uh, how long have you been considering your arms lagging behind, right? Because if you just realize now you want bigger arms, I don't know. Like, I don't know how long you've been training them for, right? He also says, and yes, workout intensity is big. Okay. Just keep doing that. <laughs> if you're eating enough and you're intense enough in your training, give it some time, right? Like, you just can't grow arms overnight. Well, I mean, but you probably could with, if you really try. If you really try. <laughs> But vary things up, right? If your intensity is high and you've been doing the same exact exercises all the time for arms, switch it up, right? So we have a video, actually it's a reel, ironically enough, talking about training the muscle from its three positions, right? It's fully lengthened, it's fully shortened in a mid-range position. Give that a shot. Try those exercises in there specifically for your biceps and see how that goes. Uh, you're probably going to notice that you'll be very, very sore. <laughs> so... So start kind of start kind of slow with it. He says it's been over a year and he hasn't made much progress. Okay. All right. Um, well, it's not working. So whatever he's <laughs> whatever you're doing now for training just isn't isn't what you need. So that's okay. Um, actually, I, I considering I don't know what his training is, yeah. I would say just scrap what you're doing now, and. <laughs> Go on to leadfts.com and search up uh, any sort of arm training that we have. We have a full-week arm program that was published pretty recently. Okay. Stefan Walterson. Ah, uh, yeah. So we'll it, we'll have to so go we'll on. Go ahead and link to that. Yeah. So we'll put a an article that was just recently written on arm training from eliteFTS.com. We'll put that in the description or the the chat box for you. Unfortunately, he's asking on the Instagram. Oh, is he? So I can't. Oh, so, all right, that's fine. So, what's his name? What was his name? Uh, G.S. Murph. All right, Murph. EliteFTS.com, search arm training. You're going to find an absolute boatload of things for you. And, you just, and it's going to be just plug and play. So, just read the article, follow the workout, implement it for a while, make sure you're eating enough, and uh, let me know how that goes. Sam, what are your current one rep maxes on the power lifts? Ooh. Well, considering I've been training for strongman, um, I don't know. I really don't know right now. If you had to ballpark it. If I had to ballpark, um, shit, I wouldn't even know how to ballpark right now. Um, I think my deadlift will probably be around 575-ish, is my guess. Um, bench press, probably sitting around fuck, 340. I can probably overhead press more than I can fucking bench press right now. Squat probably floating around 475-ish. I really don't know. I, so that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> I, can I can give you more specific strongman numbers. Um, but, yeah, in terms of actual power lifts and squat bench dead, that's probably where we're floating around right now. Right. At a lean, a lean 205. 205. <laughs> uh, 
Randy Milanowski uh, uh, super chatted us ten dollars. Nice, Randy. Thanks, man. That's awesome. Did you have a question, or was it just just a super chat? God, so Randy, Randy, if you do have a question, yeah, man. If you have a question, put one in there. We really, really appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to butcher this name. Ivana Panjak. Okay. Asks Sam, we're going to be testing one rep max at my gym in a week. Okay. This is her third time testing. Got any words of wisdom? Smiley face. Okay. Um, anytime you're testing a one rep max, I think one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is understand what works for you in terms of the lead up to it, right? You have some people that need to listen to absolute death metal and get all super jacked up leading into that one rep max. We have other people that like to be quiet, that like to be kind of to themselves. Understand what sort of cognitive tools that you have at your disposal to get the most out of it. And another thing that people tend to forget when testing their one rep maxes is if you're like a week out, if you're like a week and a half, two weeks out, Give yourself a break, right? Stop, try to give yourself some hobbies, some things to do, so you're not constantly thinking about that the whole time. Because what you'll notice is the more you think about it, the more time you spend worrying about it, the more stressed out you get, and that's kind of just zapping the system. Really take solace in knowing that, okay, you did a solid program, you have been training really, really hard, and you're gonna show up, do your best that day, and figure out where you're at. Especially, I mean, did they say it was an actual meet, or was it, just kind of a test. It seems to be just a test. Just a test. Yeah. Give yourself some time before the test, whether it's, you know, just to kind of focus in on the task at hand. Again, like a week out, don't want to spend too much time worrying about it because it's out of your control. The only thing that you can do within this week's time is screw yourself up. So don't try to test anything before test day. Don't try to do too much of accessory stuff to get any sort of butterflies out of your system. Um, just go in test day with plenty of food in the system, hydrated, well rested, and just understand that this is just a stepping stone to further your training, right? These are just gonna be percentages or uh, maxes that you have that you're gonna use as a tool to help you get better over time. If you break a PR, if you don't break a PR, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, we're just training to get better. So that's what I would say. All right, Kevin Fowler uh, has super chatted us $10. Nice, says, Kevin. No question, just thanks for all the content. Kevin, we appreciate you, man. That's awesome. I, I do notice that he comments on all our videos and whatnot, too. So, awesome, man. Really, really appreciate that. That's super cool. Zach Swim asks, do you think training overhead press has any carryover to raw bench press strength? I do, but it depends on how you bench, right? So... For example, if you're a wide bencher that has a more of a vertical bar path and a bigger arch, I wouldn't say it has a tremendous carryover. But if you were a closer grip bencher with more of a J shape, I think an overhead press is a great way for you to maintain the shoulder stability and the, over, and the capacity for those shoulders to move through a full range of motion and to be able to develop the front delts and the triceps, which are way, way more important in a closer grip uh, style of bench press. So it will depend on how you bench specifically. But I've noticed, because I'm a closer grip bench presser, that when my o strict overhead or my push press goes up, my bench has a tendency of going up too. Also, side note, if you are a closer gripped bencher, floor presses are a fantastic tool for that as well. You don't necessarily have to go overhead, but if you are gonna go overhead, uh, it's a great way to determine and to maintain a certain amount of shoulder function, which will help with your bench press long-term and to keep your shoulders healthier. So, there you go. David Ivy underscore fitness on Instagram. Asks, oh, hey David. How many sets or accessories do you recommend after your max effort lift for the day? Sets or accessories? Um, I'm imagining, imagining you're power lifter or just a strength enthusiast that just wants to get stronger. I like to keep it very similar to what Dave does, kind of a primary movement, then you have like a secondary, and then you have like the supplemental work, right? So I would say a secondary movement, so that's one, then maybe a supplemental, maybe, but for most of the, most of the time, your work will probably be better suited with 
picking a few accessories, I'd say three or four. Again, it depends on your ability to recover. It depends on your skill level as a lifter. It depends on the weights you use. It depends on how big you are. All of these things kind of factor in to determine your total amount of volume that you can actually recover from and benefit from. Um, it, it also depends on the, the part of the year that you're in. If you're in an off season, you can spend more time with variations that are further away from the main movements. But if you're getting closer to a meet where that intensity starts to rocket up and that uh, specificity needs to be there, I would actually reduce the amount of accessories that you have. Um, so it all depends, but I would say three or four accessories is probably pretty good for most people most of the time. So does that count the supplemental as an accessory? Because I know the way Dave thinks about it, you have main work, supplemental, and then And then accessories, accessories yeah. So I'd, so I'd say the supplemental does not count in that. So that's like three or four plus or minus one or two, right? So again, it depends on how much time you want to spend and on how much you can actually recover from because there are a lot of newer lifters that can probably just do some main work and then a couple accessories and then proceed to make tremendous gains in the gym uh, while other people may need just higher levels of volume. Makes sense. Makes uh, sense. <laughs> Lucas171177 uh, asks, do you have any tips for things I should do to increase my deadlift? Um, yeah, sure. Is that YouTube, Instagram? That's Instagram. Instagram. All right, Luke one seven seven one one seven seven one. Um, make sure your technique's locked in, right? Make sure that you are taking the time to really kind of feel how the lift is supposed to feel. Make sure you're not just feeling it in your low back. Make sure the form that you have for whatever variation you're doing, whether it's conventional or sumo, is locked in. People always say, yeah, technique first, for sure, but they don't really take enough time to kind of narrow down and to lock their technique in. One of the best ways to do this is to increase your amount of warm-up sets that you have. So, for example, if you usually go 135, 225, 315, go 135, 185, 225, get up, just get more volume leading up to your work, uh, your actual work sets. That's a great way to get more practice in, get more reps in. And treating the deadlift as if you're only training it for a single, right? So again, if you're a power lifter specifically trying to train for a meet, the best way you can train your deadlift is to treat it as, even if it's a set of five, treat it as five singles. So reset on every single rep. There's a place for touch and go reps, but especially if you're learning technique, I would rather you do five singles where you hit a rep, step away, reset, do that four more times than if you just touch and go or bounce the weight. So more warm-up sets and treat each set as if it's a set of singles versus a set of uh, multiple reps. DH on the YouTube asks, YouTube's over here. what would your suspicions be if a late-stage intermediate slash early advanced lifter had a squat equal to their deadlift? I would say late-stage intermediate to advanced. Strongish guy. Strongish guy that the dev they can pull more than they can squat. Squat equal to the deadlift. Squat equal to deadlift? Yeah. I mean, I would have to see. It, it sounds to me that there may be, well, first question I would, I would want for clarity is a deadlift easier for you than a squat? Have you struggled more with your squat than with your deadlift? If a deadlift is like a, a more of a natural lift, he may have the body proportions more suitable for deadlifting. So now when you're dealing with heavier weights, now you're dealing with a bigger, a bigger emphasis on, okay, you may just need to get bigger, right? You just need, may need to get stronger in certain positions. Now you need to break down the things that may have gotten you to this point and to take them a step further, right? So if you've been training the same style for so long and it's gotten you here, you may need to start focusing in on more advanced uh, means of training um, again, I don't really, I, I don't know what you look like. I don't know what the numbers are. I don't really know much about you, but I would say if you're at the level that you say that you are, you may be just reaching a point where your squat training may be best suited for an early stage intermediate, as opposed to getting the stimuli that you need specifically to, to advance more on it. Um, but everybody's going to always going to have something they're better at, right? So 
could be bench, it could be squat, it could be deadlift, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I would take a look at your training specifically, um, your body weight to see, check what you've done in the past because it may be time for a revamping um, if, if those don't start kind of getting a little bit more uh, advanced. <laughs> and if you want more information, you can always check out EliteFTS.com. Elite yep, there we go. And our other sponsor. On it and Monster. Dun, 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 dun. So for real though, these high, what are these, uh, Monster Hydros? Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Hydrate and caffeinate. Monster. At the same time. Do you want to tell the people about your, your new brain stack? That you've been oh, having? yeah. Okay, guys. This is, we're, we were going to save this for the podcast, but it's, it's next level information that I, you guys will definitely enjoy. Uh, it's going to be the, the super brain stack. It involves Monster Hydros and Alpha Brain. So you stack those, and that's going to be what's going to be fueling our podcast going forward. We are going to be next level, absolutely to the moon with cognitive abilities. If you think me and Dave can ramble on for a couple hours on a podcast, you'll be blown away. It's going to be six-hour podcast coming up, and we won't even speak. It'll just be telepathic. <laughs> yep. Thayer2513 Is asks, that my buddy? There. No, my ja James Thayer. Uh, Lee, is he Thayer twenty five thirteen? I think he is. Well, there he is. What has been your favorite Elite FTS equipment to train on? Um, hmm, good question. I am a huge. I've always had in the gyms that I trained at really shitty benches, like just like typical commercial gyms. Uh, really thin pads and wobbly. So when I actually was able to utilize a, a competition bench from Elite FTS for the first time, it was like night and day. Um, so I would say it, when people are like, oh, the equipment doesn't matter. The equipment matters a lot, especially when you're handling a, a decent amount of weight on anything. Having that stability, knowing that the bench isn't going to break underneath you or you're not going to wobble and you actually have a pad that you can sink your shoulder blades into, it's life-changing and it will actually make you a better lifter when you can utilize equipment that is sound and will just support you no matter how much weight's on the bar. What time is it? It is 4.3. Oh, cool. So we'll do a couple, yeah, we'll do a couple more and then we'll sign off. Um, someone wants to know if we are planning on filming and uploading more Train Your Ass Off. Aha, we are. So with the Train Your Ass Off, we have several events coming up in the next couple, uh, actually, shit, like a month, about yeah. a month or so. Yeah. We're going to have a ton of footage of that. Um, so stay tuned for those. They're going to be really, really cool. Um, we have different, a bunch of stuff going on with the Train Your Ass Off, and it's going to be absolutely amazing. So good question. Thank you for that. And yes, we will. Plenty. Plenty, plenty. A YouTube user simply known as I says, <laughs> any advice on gripping the bar during deadlift? As I pull the bar, my grip begins to slip. Um, make sure you're actually gripping the bar with your whole hand. Um, a lot of times when people are gripping a bar, whether you're over, under, or whatever, they don't actually think about their pinky and their ring finger, and they don't bury that bar into their hand, right? So... When you have a bar, you want to make sure you shove that thumb down, grip with your hand, almost like a lobster claw. And then what I like to do is I like to wrap every single finger around to make sure that every single aspect of that hand is gripping that bar. Uh, most of the time, people are normally just gripping with their thumb, their middle finger, and their index finger. They're not really thinking about the pinky. Squeeze the pinky as hard as you can on that bar, and you'll notice a couple things will happen. One, your grip will be better, and your arms will stay locked out and it'll reduce the range of motion on a deadlift anyway because your arms are longer. So that's what I would say with that. Grip the bar better with your pinky. All right. Uh, Nick Dorman asks, best ways to increase your bench? Gain 50 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the bench is definitely one of the <laughs> biggest lifts when it comes to if you gain weight, you're going to get stronger in it. So I would say step one, gain weight. But also step two, spend some time. I, you can press a lot more than once a week, right? So for most intermediates, you could have two pressing days 
a week. I usually have a primary pressing day where it's either you're working on a bench or an overhead press for me, and then a secondary pressing day where I work on a ton of dumbbell volume and variations to, it's, it's more of a hypertrophy focused day, but you're still trying to push the weight and get stronger. So I would say if what you're doing right now is not getting your bench up, throw in a secondary pressing day and see how that works after a few weeks. Renee Sellen asks, hi Sam, do you have a recovery routine? If so, what does it look like? Yeah, recovery routine, uh, again, very simple. Walk, eat food, and get plenty of sleep. But if I'm looking for something more specific, even during the day, like even just working here during the day, I'll take some time, we'll take a walk, maybe hit, the, hit a foam roller, get some stretching in kind of open up that upper back, sitting at a desk all the whole time, right? Kind of stiffens everything up. Uh, but post-training, movement is going to be what you want to do. Get the blood flowing. It doesn't necessarily matter what you do, but anytime you have a hard training session and then you just sit on your ass for a couple days, you're going to be sore, tight, and feel like shit. Always getting that blood flow, always getting that movement in, whether it be walking, it can be walking on a treadmill, it can be walking outside. It can be on an elliptical. It can be whatever you want to do. Just get the blood flowing and get kind of get moving. Um, a feeder workout could be good. Super lightweight. Hit some band work. Some face pull-aparts. Just kind of get motion in those areas. Upper back, thoracic spine, maybe a little bit of core work. Just, again, it just light stuff to make the body start moving as opposed to uh, just staying tight and locked in those positions. So, again, super simple, super easy. But that's what I got. What do we got? The hound that rides on the Instagram. That is a serious name. I, a let's we'll do this. This will be the last one, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, what would you recommend for helping with developing explosive leg drive on the conventional deadlift? Explosive leg drive. Good question. Um, one of the tools that we've actually talked about in the YouTube video, Dave and Juji did deficit pulls. Um, those are really, really good. Developing just powerful, strong quads in general, um, making sure that you're starting from an advantageous position for you, because uh, a lot of times people will force themselves into, into bad positions on a deadlift because they see somebody else deadlift like that. Um, being efficient with your movement, efficient with your technique, and you know, honestly, training more like an athlete, I think would benefit a lot of people incorporating a lot of jumps, incorporating bounds. Um, yeah, really, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. Just train more explosively, add jumps in. That's a great way to do that. Uh, build up just tremendous, tremendous. I hit that, but I'm bringing it more. Tremendous. Um, deficit pulls are great. Uh, even using a trap bar. Trap bar is a really good tool. Uh, work on some single leg stuff, some Bulgarians. Those are really, really good. And again, it, it kind of all boils down to making sure that that technique is locked in and your body is nice and tight. So the force that you do produce now is being properly utilized when you pull that bar off the floor, pulling that slack out, getting those lats locked down and it, locked down and tight, solid grip, strong chest, strong upper back, everything's locked in, core engaged. I think you'd be surprised at how much more drive you can get out of the bottom of a deadlift if you're technically sound uh, throughout the rest of that lift as well. So give that a shot. All right. Want to wrap it up? For yeah, today? let's do that. All right, guys. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, uh, share, like, subscribe, follow us, share our stuff. Um, we're excited to, again, be partnering with Onnit for the podcast going forward. Let's check out that link in the subscription box or the, the chat box here. Uh, get your get your yeah, your below there for your free sample of alpha brain very cool stuff thank you instagram thank you youtube any questions shoot them down below and we will get to them next time all right and we're out